Hello, I'm delighted to have you all here today to hear from Jose Castillo. I am Nicole Freeman and I work in the Development and Alumni Relations Department at the GSD. I'm delighted, as I mentioned, that you all are here today and I'm thrilled to introduce and hear from my colleague and our colleague at the GSD. And I would like to say friend, Jose Castillo, to talk about his project, Housing in Mexico, a multi-year exploration. Jose is both a GSD alum from the MARC 1995 class and the DDES 2000 class. And he has been a visiting professor at the GSD for the last nine years. He is based in Mexico City and leads alongside Saidi Springall, another GSD alum, the firm A911, their architecture and urban planning office. The studios and courses he has taught, including those with Diane Davis, address both design and social issues through interdisciplinary participation. The last studio, Beyond the Mayan Train, Housing and Infrastructure, looked at how the design disciplines can think through the problems of planning, development, environmental preservation, housing and infrastructure as alternative responses to the idea of large mega projects. This is a studio about recognizing the contradictory forces shaping territories and about using plans, policies, and projects to imagine better futures. He will present on housing in Mexico, a multi-year exploration Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jose Castillo and I will be talking today about the uh, studio I taught last year, fall of 2019, called Beyond the Mayan Train, Housing, housing and Infrastructure in the Yucatan Peninsula. Similar to many of you, I'm a GSD alum, I graduated in 1995 uh, from the MR2 program and in 2000 uh, from the DDES program. The last nine years I've been teaching at the GSD on and off. And I'd like to share a little bit of uh, what we have been doing in some of these studios and most specifically about this uh, particular studio that I taught one year ago. This almost decade of studios have addressed some of the interests that came out of my time at the GSD. The notion that there's a continuum between the design disciplines, from landscape to urban design, from architecture to planning. And though I was a GSD architecture graduate, somehow it opened the, my mind to thinking about the problems of design in a broader way. And the studios I have been teaching have, have tried to address that. And many of those through the lens of housing. In a way, these studios uh, and the, the other courses I've taught have to do with a particular understanding I have about architecture. In a way, how does the practice and the discipline of architecture engage other forces, social, economic, political forces. Engagement is about compromise, commitment, agreement, contract, meeting, fight, action, and duty, but it's also about resistance. It's about knowing how we say uh, no to certain clients, to certain prospects. And it seems to me that housing actually allows uh, architecture to be a lens about these forms of engagement and these forms of resistance. As another key part I'm uh, keen on, on understanding through the design studio is the notion of how we connect the physical with the social. At the end of the day, we're at a design school, but it is also about design as allowing us to look and interpret and think and transform many of the other forces. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very much interested about how design comes uh, sometimes after, sometimes during, and sometimes before the decisions of those many other projects. All of these studios have been multidisciplinary in, in their approach. I'm curious about this notion of expanded design, how we think through the problems of non-physical issues in physical ways. The first studio I taught in 2013 had to do with what I call the wicked problem of housing, in, in understanding how housing is not a linear it's not about a linear solution. It's not about only designing uh, typologies, or it's not only about understanding the relationship between the house and the city, but it's also about understanding the normative processes 
that produce a particular and specific kind of housing. We worked and visited Mexico City. Out of the 12 students, uh, we had students from all the disciplines and all the programs, which has been the norm with many of, uh, of uh, the studios I've taught. In 2014, I taught a studio with Diane Davis uh, called the Flexible Leviathan, in which we were looking at how large-scale urban transformations, both through landscape, through urban, but also through questions of housing, could begin to transform and look into uh, areas in, in Mexico City that were uh, kept outside the loop of investment. And in this particular area called Iztapalapa, we were dealing with social forces that tend to be obscured in uh, the discussions about architecture and the discussions about urban design. We truly believe that uh, somehow conversation and deliberation are also acts of design. So in the process of expanding our notions of what architecture can do, we were able to actually involve the students in more complex understandings of a site. From 2015 on, for three years, Diane and myself worked on a series of sponsored studios sponsored by Infonavit, which is the National Housing uh, Investment Fund. It is the equivalent of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac in the US. And there were studios geared to look at, um, at housing in a broader lens in the first year in the lens of uh, processes of uh, industrialization and, and de-industrialization. What does it mean for housing to become a force of transformation in places where we're losing population, but also in places where we can think regionally, such as uh, the places where we worked in the, in the Bajio region in Mexico, but also in the area of Tlanepantla. The second uh, studio uh, was addressing uh, craft politics and the production of housing in Oaxaca, looking at how the particular way of producing politics fragmented about conflict in an era where the territory is very much organized outside the fringes of our, of our traditional understanding of private property. How could we use housing to think about these problems, sometimes mediating, but also sometimes being more assertive in terms of, of uh, its own capacities. In that third studio, we worked actually in the Yucatan Peninsula, in a studio called the Urban and the Territorial. And we were looking at the region in Merida, specifically, and how could we think problems such as density, sprawl, but also cultural patterns of development as techniques to think about housing in an innovative fashion. Diane and myself during these three studios, uh, because Diane comes from the world of social sciences, uh, from the world of sociology actually, uh, we think that this connection between the physical and the social can actually be achieved in the format of the studio. And uh, most of all, it can also achieve, be, uh, be, uh, be achieved through conversation. It is not only in the act of drawing, which is the key aspect of any design studio, but it is also through the act of actually engaging with others outside our disciplines. We have been fortunate to have over those four studios we taught together, uh, almost split in equal parts, people from the architecture, from the landscape, from the architecture and urban design program, and from the master in urban planning. And this means that there's an actually a, a uh, a hunger at the school to think through the problems of housing transversally. Beyond the Mayan train is a studio that actually rises from two polemics. On the one hand, a kind of moment of a new appeal of a uh, personality such as Alexander von Humboldt, whose uh, 200 years anniversary was in 2019. And, and Humboldt has become more and more relevant in the disciplines of architecture, planning, but also um, territorial history, because Humboldt was able to think through the process of traveling as a means of expanding our knowledge of, uh, of the world. And actually using some of the techniques that we use as landscape architects, architects, urban designers and planners to expose new knowledge. Humboldt spent a lot of time in Mexico uh, he did not visit the Yucatan Peninsula, but he produced some of the most beautiful books, plans, and drawings, as well as letters to the Viceroy, and a very comprehensive understanding of how the political, the economic, have a, a framing and have a, a grounding in the territory. And, uh, and of course, Yucatan has been a land very much geared to that notion of travel. 
people like Catherwood and Stevens in their incidents of travel through Yucatan were actually thinking of using the journey as a sense of discovery, which then became the key aspect of the Renaissance of Mayan culture uh, many, decades, many centuries uh, later. The Mayan train was a polemic plan announced uh, almost two years ago by the incoming president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, to be a 1,000 mile long piece of infrastructure that in his words would bring the new development and create a new mode of uh, wealth creation to the region. Part of the polemic has been in, in whether the ambitions of uh, using infrastructure to, uh, to the south of the country are the right tools. And here's actually, I think, a disciplinary and a, uh, and a professional question is, to what extent do we uh, uh, use our tools and uh, use our techniques to actually uh, bridge those gaps that have to do with space, with design, with infrastructure, with the landscape, with the connection of the economic, the social, and the political. For the Mexican government, the Mayan train would be the structuring axis for investment and development that would reverse the centuries of marginalization and poverty. In a very symbolic act, the president asked Mother Earth whether the train would be approved. In a way, um, ignoring other deliberation processes, such as uh, consultations, referendums, which have not been used in the decision to bring in the Mayan train. And this is one of the reasons why there's certain opposition to the Mayan train from uh, original communities, from the indigenous townships, but for, for many other activists which see this model of development catering only to a very specific elite, which is the tourist, uh, the tourism's uh, arriving to the, to the Yucatan Peninsula. So it is for us to beg the question of uh, what model of infrastructure do we need? And how does it relate to economic growth and development? How do we want to achieve, what do we want to achieve with the train and who benefits from it? How does this relate to housing production? And how do we address the collateral damage of development? And Yucatan is actually a particularity in Mexico because in many respects has fantastic uh, indicators. It's one of the safest areas to live in Mexico, but it's actually disconnected both nationally and within the state. It has some of the most amazing natural conditions. A large percent of the state is very much uh, natural areas to be preserved, hence the polemic about the train. But it also relates to social vulnerab vulnerabilities, some of them historic, but some of them more recent. 47.9% of Yucatan's inhabitants live in poverty. Is there a way to think through housing and development to address these questions of poverty alleviation? And also to relate it to the 30% of the Yucatan population that it, that it speaks indigenous language and that's identified as an indigenous community. Uh, let alone the heritage and culture that we've come to understand and appreciate uh, from a place from Yucatan. And on the other side, the role that tourism has represented in the, in the whole region, both the Yucatan state and the state of Quintana Roo. So when we think about infrastructure, do we think about airports, do we think about trains, roads, or, or even uh, artisan well to bring water to a community? Do we think about this relationship between housing as just a sprawl on the peripheries of the large cities? Or do we think about the train as a possible structural agent in understanding and transforming the territory? So this study is very much about rethinking the relationship between housing and infrastructure. The initial stages of the studio were to look at the regimes of urbanization. How does the territory get transformed? Because we tend to think that architecture it is the driving force in the transformation of cities, landscapes, and territories. But when we look at the regimes of transformation and urbanization in a place such as Yucatan, we will immediately see that from the Solar Maya, which used to be the old, uh, the traditional housing and urbanization system, to the cloister and convents of the colonial ages, to the haciendas uh, of the 18th and 19th century, to the uh, traditional system of cities uh, such as Merida and its expansions in, Buleva, in, in Paseo Montejo, or even to the infrastructure of ports of the old townships such, such as Acanque, or the new development of affordable housing. What does, uh, how does the city get transformed? And this was a key question for us. How do we become agents of change? How do we have a sense of 
social, economic, political agency, but also physical agency. Uh, not to ignore the other forces that come outside our traditional disciplines, such as salt works, such as agro-industry, or even uh, energy produ uh, uh, production, such as the wind farms in Tilim de Bravo. We started the semester uh, looking at these forms and trying to understand how, do, how could we either harness them, resist them, or use housing as a technique of, uh, of addressing them in a more cohesive way. Since this is a studio trip, we feel that the road trip, that the trip is also the first form of research. Getting to know the territory is a crucial way of opening up our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our guts, and our brains to different ways of, uh, of thinking. And sometimes the trip tends to be misunderstood as just a touristic device, visiting pyramids, or having other or kind of a non-research non tools. But actually this trip was about speaking with the voices from the city planner of, uh, in Merida to the activists and the architects resisting the Mayan train. Let me say that we started this project in an agnostic fashion towards, towards the Mayan train. I personally have my positions on, on the train uh, and, and why I think it's problematic. But we started and I let, and I asked the students to suspend judgment, to come in with an agnostic mind and let the evidence talk about what is the train doing, how is it doing, who is it benefiting. And, uh, and, and during our time, during almost the 10 days we spent in the Yucatan Peninsula, we were able to talk with architects, with, uh, with social activists. We were able to look at the places where the, the train would impact, such as Isamal, to look at, to talk with people from the UN habitat and the way that this project is either engaging or going against the grain of some of the transformations required for an area such as Yucatan. We were able to visit natural reserves and in a similar fashion, if we did not get on a train, but we almost, we did planes, boats and automobiles. Uh, so in this almost 1000 kilometer long uh, road trip, we were able to understand the broader sense of the territory and how does housing have an impact and how can we think of housing infrastructure as, a, as ways to have less impact where we need less impact in the territory and more impact when, where we need more impact, which is in terms of uh, social uh, change, poverty alleviation, and uh, a more orderly ter territorial transformation. And of course, it's also about pleasure just a few days in a conversation between Sarah Whiting and Rafael Moneo, Rafael was, was laying out this idea that it is important for academic institutions to connect uh, the idea that learning is also a form of pleasure. We were able to extend ex and expand that pleasure to swimming in a sinkhole, uh, one of the most fantastic geological formations in, uh, all, our, all across the Yucatan Peninsula but also to relate it to the cultural production of uh, food and having the most wonderful cochinita or the pulled pork traditional of, uh, of the Yucatan Peninsula. We visited places like Valladolid with its former convent. We climbed pyramids and we also finished in the Caribbean Sea in Tulum and later on in Cancun. Looking at all the way that these regimes of, uh, of urban transformation and its own forms of production of housing were either um, positively or negatively transforming the territory. Every studio, it's about the people and the conversations you engage with. And I have to thank every one of those 12 students who put up with me and who had to deal with distance and distraction and uh, late planes arriving and early planes departing and trying to do and engage in their best way to make this a very productive semester. Similar to the other studios I've taught, it was a quite diverse group in terms of uh, disciplines. It was quite balanced in terms of gender. And it was very, I was very fortunate to have smart, critical voices that took out the best in me. Um, the work I'm going to show today, and I, I'm not here to 
just explain the work. We'll have a chance to talk with a couple of the students later on. But, but I'm curious to see how the work fits or responds to the agenda I laid out. And of course, as in any, any studio, there's always shortcomings. There's disappointments, but there's also surprises. And this studio without Lamia and Brett, without Jimena and uh, Justin, without Mora, Sam, Juan David, uh, and Rafael, without Angela and Siwen, and without Kayla and Saeb, uh, would have not been the same. And I thank every one of them for their effort. Each of these groups addressed the question of, uh, of the Yucatan uh, infrastructure and housing through a different way. And I was actually surprised to see that without, uh, with the exception of one of the studios, uh, all, of the, all of the teams resisted the idea that infrastructure such as a train would be positive. Uh, and the surprises and the responses are quite engaging in a way. The group of Mora, Sam, Juan David, and Rafael actually decided to address a territory which is in the middle of nowhere, the least developed, the least urbanized, uh, the least uh, serviced in terms of infrastructure in the state of Yucatan. And so that decision to work there is already, in a way, an ethical commitment to the land and an ethical commitment to the, to the kind of work that architecture planning and urban design do. And this area requires a different type of infrastructure. It was almost like a, like a, a, a kind of a claim by the students in this team that how can we discuss the question of a train for tourists where we have communities with no minimum water and, and uh, sewage infrastructure. So the program is about reimagining the role that infrastructure plays and how could we design a, a system that embedded agricultural production, the two waste management at the level of a house, a block, a town, a, in a more sustainable fashion. To think of infrastructure from the toilet upwards is actually quite powerful in a studio. Siwens and Angela's project had to do with the space between three towns along the uh, uh, Ushmal peto axis to the south of the state. And they were interested in looking at how the regime of, uh, of agricultural production could become simultaneously a way of uh, thinking through more, uh, more embedded uh, forms of housing housing and uh, agriculture working together, but also to think through the longer cycles of the land production. It was a beautiful diagram where they were analyzing the milpa system, the way the traditional agricultural system were change in the crops, uh, changing the seasons, changing the patterns of uh, doing agriculture could have a more sustainable attitude. So learning from this is a way of we that uh, Siwen and uh, and Angela were approaching the production of housing. It is somewhere an in-between between the farmhouse, the market, and the traditional uh, township in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, the team by Brett and Lamia was, uh, was working in a, in a multiplicity of skills, thinking of how the impact of the train would have on each of the municipalities it crossed, and how could we relate that impact uh, that specific impact of the train vis-a-vis -vis the, the sense of primacy that each of these cities and townships have uh, with regards to the state as a whole. And it is obvious that Brett and Lamia discovered the asymmetries in urban development. The large cities are where the budgets are taken, and hence there's a replication of a system of uh, territorial inequity. And um, their project uh, works transversally through plan, through policy, but also to, through project, to look at how the train could be used, not as an infrastructure itself, but actually as a model of wealth distribution, looking at the cities in terms of sizes, impact, uh, but also looking at the places where the train could, uh, could serve as a reason to, to restructure uh, the peripheries of those, uh, of those towns and cities. The team comprised by Jimena and Justin was interested in looking similar to other teams in the southeast part of the region, the most impoverished part of the state, 
and, and, and thinking of how we could use transit or rear interdevelopment to connect, to connect it to two very key aspects of uh, underdevelopment in the Yucatan Peninsula. One is education and the other one is housing. So to look at a region and to think of a, let's call it a, a regional uh, bus transit, uh, ra rapid transit system in which rather than a train, a set of buses will be connecting these communities and connecting the places where colleges, uh, technical colleges, universities and higher education could provide access to a region uh, at large. But also in the same time to use those uh, middle and micro interventions as techniques to restructure the relationship between institutions and the centers. So the bus station simultaneously achieves a civic quality, but also understanding accessibility, not only as a transportation benefit, but also one that can bring education to impoverished communities. And finally, the team by Saeb Ali Khan and Kleila. And um, they were working outside the area uh, where the um, Mayan train is supposed to pass. It's an area called Las Coloradas. It's a, a, set, a set of salt works facing the northern part of the state of Yucatan. A beautiful and, uh, and a strange uh, artificial landscape and a company town that very much connects to the booming times in the region in the, up until the 1930s. And what this team was addressing is whether we could think of a, this, um, this relationship between landscape, uh, industry, uh, a company town, and the new services such as tourism as a way to think through a, a more sort of a balance and equitable relationship between these forces, tourism and social development. So their, their, their work is kind of simultaneously re reimagining the company town, but also thinking very closely and looking at typologies that could cater to other social agents, not only the workers of the salt works, but actually the tourists visiting more and more this part of the state. All these students uh, uh, were actually, in spite of their specific interest, were very much uh, uh, having a diagonal conversation. It's not about a sort of silo work, each student or each team working alone, but actually thinking as a studio as a whole. And I think there's always shortcomings and one wants to have more of that conversation. But, uh, but to an extent, the diversity and plurality of all these approaches is testament to, to this kind of a pedagogical uh, method. Um, one cannot forget, uh, similar to what I was saying earlier, is that um, a studio is only as good as the people it involves, and not only the local conversation of uh, many agents during our trip, and further conversations um, that the students kept along with local actors, but through all the guest critics that participated in the distinct pinups, midterm and final reviews. And I can only be grateful to them. I have asked uh, Saeb and Jimena, two of the former students, to have a conversation uh, uh, with me and between them about um, the pros and cons of the studio, of the methodology, but to actually think of how this also relates to the questions of practicing uh, beyond the GSE. Um, I'll invite them to join the conversation and then later we can have a question and answer session. Uh, thank you very much. So I took the liberty to invite two of our uh, former students, uh, Jimena David Garza and Saeb Ali Khan, uh, who took the studio uh, beyond the Mayan train. And um, I'd like uh, Jimena and Saeb to share with, uh, with the audience uh, some of your reflections about the studios, what went well, what did not work, and what are some of the challenges uh, in terms of pedagogy, but also in terms of the practice uh, from studios such as this one. Well, thank you, Jose, for inviting us. Um, I would say, for starters, that this option studio was probably the most stressful, uh, but also one of the most, one of the spaces where I learned most at the GSE. It was just 
so many things to learn and so many things to do in such a small amount of time that you didn't, you just had to learn everything so fast. And it was very enriching uh, experience. Also getting to work with people from different disciplines gave me a lot of different perspectives. Um, and by, by that time, I, I took this in my second year. So I had like my first year to like hone my skills and my abilities and get like some the lay of the land. And then when I got to the studio, I was, I, I felt a little confident. And then I, I was in front of all these amazing people with very different uh, backgrounds and abilities. And it just blew my mind. And I learned so much from them and from you. Jimena, you come from the world of uh, political science, uh, so you're not trained as a designer. How do you think the studio format uh, at the GSD works to address, let's say, the non-design issues of, um, of a design studio, if, uh, if we can actually resolve that paradox? I have good experiences in that respect, but I also understand that a lot of people struggle with that sometimes. Like, you want to do something that's more... Like, you know, you want to connect with the community, you want to do some um, more social work with your design. And in some studios, I know that some instructors are not as welcoming to that. Um, you know, they're more focused on the design aspects and the material aspects uh, of the, the practice. And yeah, it's, it's a constant struggle um, to try to find a balance between these two because you don't know you also don't want to leave the design part uh, out of it I mean during the design school that's what you're here that's what you're learning but you don't or at least me I don't want to leave like that part of me outside of the studio um, in this one in particular I found spaces to do that spaces to balance it Uh, sometimes you had to tell me like yeah that's okay but you also have to come to the material a little bit more And that was okay. Uh, that was part of the knowledge experience and the learning experience. Sayed, you probably have a kind of a more of a of a dual format because uh, you you've addressed the questions through design and uh, as a, with an architectural training, but also interested in the questions of urban design and and planning. Can you share with us a little bit about uh, that easiness or, or or in other cases the difficulties that came out of the studio? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I was I was also coming uh, to the GSD with three or four years of practice. So what I was looking for was a flexible brief that allowed me to choose my site, choose what issue I'm trying to address through design, uh, which is a lot harder in practice because you have a pretty much set brief. Uh, and it's flexible in some ways, but not as flexible as um, uh, the studio basically allowed us to be. Um, and, um, you know, uh, That sort of a brief also attracted a very diverse cohort, which I think otherwise would not be possible. I mean, we have people from the architecture, landscape architecture, urban design and urban planning programs. So that itself uh, was, was a big asset for the studio, I think. But of course, it, it came with its challenges because not everyone from all of the disciplines felt equally represented. Um, and um, I think um, uh, Clelia and I also sort of uh, ran into that issue when we were working in Las Coloradas because um, as designers, we we sort of uh, like had the skill set to deal with the design aspect, but we were also dealing with a very complex political situation. And we, we like we did run into issues with that, but I think uh, like having um, like diverse uh, reviewers come in and uh, sort of having like a midterm check-in and then uh, a couple of other like desk scripts with, with, with someone uh, with a planning uh, uh, training like Diane, I think that, that, that really helped. I think you, you touch upon uh, something which I had not thought about, which is if studios such as this ones work better for students who have been at the GSD already one or two years. Um, and, and now that you mention it, probably for the, uh, for the two incoming MR2s taking the studio, it was actually a tougher challenge in terms of understanding a much broader matrix Of, uh, of issues and questions and, uh, and data. Uh, so I, I don't know about, I mean, that, that's also kind of the limits of, of a super wide broad, uh, scope and broad studios, but uh, um, it would be interesting to know how they 
let's say, rebound from an experience like this one uh, to move to, to a different kind of a more focused studio. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think even uh, with um, the way that the deliverables were sort of structured throughout the studio, I think it gave us enough flexibility to start to sort of deal with things that uh, uh, that the GSC talks about a lot, which is like the culture, the politics of the place. Um, and because these deliverables were not set, like we didn't have to produce a set of drawings for every review. Like I, for example, read ethnographic research for one solid month. And that gave me so much insight into the place and the people. And that eventually like got us to, uh, I mean, it, 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 it informed our design in a much richer way, I think. Um, and so these, I mean, I think the structure of the deliverables was also uh, something that worked well with the uh, brief of the studio. Jimena, uh, you are you were born and raised in Mexico, so for you it was a different kind of culture shock. Uh, but but I'm curious if you can talk with the alumni a little bit about how uh, studio trips and travel studios, which uh, kind of put you in a different situation, and in this case we it was halfway between the a road trip and a, and a research uh, venture. But, but, but I'm curious for you to see how the other students were reacting uh, with that territory that you were more familiar or whether you also had those, those issues of uh, uh, wow moments, opening up uh, uh, to new knowledge, new conversations, new territories. Uh, I'm curious about that, Jimena. Yeah, I definitely had a bunch of wow moments during the trip. I had been to some of these places before, but I was seeing them kind of for the first time, you know, with a new set of eyes. Um, and also being there with people from different disciplines and that were not from there and had never been there. You know, the things they, they pointed out at me were so interesting. And I, I really wanted to go back afterwards and see, because like we went there to get like the initial feeling of like the site, but we didn't have a project or we hadn't chosen a scale yet. And by the time we moved with our projects, I was like, oh, I want to go back because there's so much that I could now see again with even newer eyes. And it was such a valuable experience to be able to experience those sites and to, you know, meet with all the people we met that are working there and are uh, conducting projects uh, in different type of things like in mobility or in uh, urban development or sustainability. And it was just getting to know these places from within, not just as a tourist, not just as a citizen of that country, but like as a practitioner. And that was very valuable. Um, I'm not sure, like my, my two core studios, you had some relationship to the site, but not this much. And it, it gives you a lot of new tools and, and it engages you with the site in a different way because you sort of, when you're doing your project, you don't want to fail those towns or those cities. Like you, you get this emotional connection to it as well when you get to visit and know the people there. I've been always curious with the question of the design profession and with architectural education vis-a-vis -vis this thing I called engagement. How do we engage the world at large, but also the, the polemical projects and the, pro, and the problematic of politics? Um, and we chose as a, as a studio uh, problem the idea of a Mayan train, a, a polemic uh, piece of infrastructure. We approached this in an agnostic way without giving, or at least without showing my, my full deck of cards about what I thought about the project. I'm, I'm interested in studios that address these uh, professional uh, practice challenges. I'm curious whether your, your thoughts vis-a-vis -vis the project changed during the studio or, or, or they just reinforced positions uh, when you started learning and listening and, and researching about what the project is about and what's the role of architectural planners and urban designers in, in, in working or staying away or voicing, uh, siding on the voice of a, of a community uh, regarding these projects. Any thoughts on that? This is a question that I sort of struggled throughout my MUP and I will probably continue to struggle with it my whole life, because 
yes, obviously you want to do right by a community. You want to give them the space they need, the space they want, you know, a space where they can fully develop and be happy, be healthy, be safe. Um, but from time to time, a lot actually, you encounter sometimes communities that want things that you think you know are not ideal. Maybe you don't know, but you know, sometimes they want big roads or they want development that will devastate um, a forest or something like that. And it's also sort of respecting their position at the same time as you try to open a dialogue in which you can explain to them why maybe that's not the best idea. So like, for example, with the Mayan train, there are a lot of communities that are opposed it. There are also a lot of towns and cities that want it because it can bring development. So, and because of the train passing a bunch of places in a huge territory, they, they all should have a voice. And even if, like the communities are not in agreement about what they want to do with that. And as a practitioner approaching the site, you're sort of like, well, I have my own opinions, but like the people that actually live there also have their own opinions. And none of us have found common ground. And that's a huge challenge for you because should you give more weight to your own opinions about this and try to like impose your ideas? Should you listen to one side or to the other? Should you be sort of a mediator between these two. It's a constant um, tension between that, that doesn't have any easy answers. Someone is always gonna be unhappy with the result. I think to build off of what uh, Jimena just said, I think I felt exactly the same way. Um, we, when we first went to Las Colorados, we saw this extraordinary landscape and uh, as an architect, urban designer, you know, uh, we were like, we should, we should definitely do something here. but. And when we uh, sort of came back and started to really look at the place, we saw how much uh, 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 sort of context we have to deal with uh, uh, politically, ecologically. And, 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 and that's something that uh, the format of the studio really helped with because we had planners that we could speak to these issues about. Um, and uh, as a designer, uh, we, we were sort of, um, uh, like we were trying to leverage our skills as, uh, as visualizers to sort of bring uh, this 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 large industry um, who who controls everything and and people who live there who control nothing to sort of bring them together and find a way to uh, uh, sort of find a solution that works for everyone and I think that would not have been possible without um, bringing in planners and sort of understanding uh, uh, that situation to design infrastructure which uh, would be so much richer and so much better for the place uh, than just being um, uh, objects that that look beautiful. I think that's a uh, a, ra a great way to wrap up. Uh, uh, Saeed, Jimena, I'd like to thank you and uh, thank everyone here at the GSI, GSE alumni reunion. And uh, we look forward to keep on using the studios as a way of uh, expanding the conversation within the school and with all this, the community outside the school. So. Thank you very much for participating. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Jose, for putting together that wonderful presentation and for including students in your, in your studio and engaging them as well. It's really fascinating. So I have uh, one question right now, and I hope everyone else will please uh, continue to submit questions for us. We have about 10 minutes for the Q&A now before we move on. So. One question is, you talk about politics and engaging the world at large. And I'm wondering, you know, through all of that, and especially during this time when economic, social, spatial um, injustices and inequalities are really magnified right now and sometimes seem so daunting, how do you keep your students and even the young designers at your firm motivated and feeling really optimistic about the power of design to make change for the good? I, I think that that's a very complex question, Nicole. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I guess in, you know, one or two words. <laughs> in 10 seconds, I would say, now, I, I think that many of these challenges um, at the core are very much about space 
and uh, how they get materialized in space. So I, I do think um, designers at large have a, have a stake in the possible uh, interpretations of these problems in, and in the way that we reframe them as solutions. I do think that whether it is a, a social and spatial injustice, I think that whether it is about infrastructures that uh, segment rather than unite it, in the way that housing uh, as a policy uh, gets uh, directed to people who are not in, uh, who are not needing it the most. I think that's where we make a kind of a, a ethical and, and uh, political and professional reflection. And I, I do think that in different capacities, most of our studios uh, have tried to do that. I, I think that uh, it is a challenge to remain optimistic in these times, as Sarah was saying earlier in a kind of a very, uh, almost cold, uh, non-judgmental fashion. If you have a chance to vote in November, <laughs> please do. Um, but I do think that we have to imagine that the that the impact of architecture in this uh, in these discussions is ongoing. It's not about uh, going out to vote every three years, or it's not about uh, saying yes or no to to some of these uh, projects. Is about uh, is about almost taking a reformist attitude through the work we do, through the lenses and uh, the ways we engage. There's already um, a change in the making. So to give an example, I'm happy that, to see that uh, Raymond McLean is here, who was um, when I was a teaching fellow for Alberto Calach. He was a student, and uh, it was a student uh, studio on the Lake Texcoco. And, and just now, 20 years, almost 20 years after that studio, there's a, there's a plan to recover Texcoco. So the time frames we work with uh, make an impact. And, uh, and that's where I think there, there's a possibility to remain optimistic about the, the claims and the disciplinary concerns of our professions. Well, speaking of which, Raymond McLean has a question for you here uh, regarding, I think, the time since you were in studio with them. So how would you characterize the changes in the past 20 years in the design discussion regarding large urban projects in Mexico? Well, I do think, and I've always tried, um, I've always tried to address the studios, let me say, in a non-chauvinistic way. In other words, I don't come with, uh, with my Mexican flag in my, <laughs> on my heart. Uh, uh, but I tried to use the challenges we were facing as a developing economy or a developing country to address uh, wider challenges. Uh, from, uh, from the studio I was a teaching fellow 22 years ago that Raymond took, it was about uh, this relationship between uh, environmental concerns, hydrological concerns, and the city. I think these questions, even more so nowadays, are at the core of, uh, of what uh, makes a professional uh, discussion relevant. I think that studio connects to, to, to sort of the work in uh, downtown Manhattan after Hurricane Sandy in, in more ways that it relates to other concerns about Mexico City. Um, partially, and I, I, Monica Healy, who was also a partner, an incredible asset during the three studios, uh, Diane and myself caught up with uh, in Fonavit. Uh, um, I think she knows what it, how hard it is to simultaneously uh, uh, problematize the big decisions, the idea of the capital A projects, uh, uh, while simultaneously finding new ways to, to tap into other concerns, which are more bottom up, which are uh, at the borders or the margins of the discipline. I mean, is there, are, are there solutions? I, when I look at the outcomes of, uh, of some of the studios uh, in these past uh, years, I always figure whether I'm not kind of a, a uh, not being enough of an architect, <laughs> enough of a, of a designer, uh, let's say compared to other housing studios, which are very much about these typologies, internal space, uh, the morphology of the city. These studios connect to economies and politics in, in broader ways. And, and I think that still very much re remains a question. 20 years after 
that studio about Tescoco, uh, Raymond. So I, I think that the, the, whether there is a train, the refinery or the new airport uh, coming after the old airport, uh, the Foster and Romero airport, these are problematics in Mexico that have an impact uh, and have a relationship to, to some other challenges that many cities are facing, both in the, in the Americas at large, but also in Europe and in Asia. Another question for you here. Um, going back to the, the, the last studio, the Mayan train, um, you were very familiar with the project and you had you know, a, your opinion regarding the train. And I'm just wondering throughout the course, what was most significant, significant to you or a new perspective that you might've taken away from teaching the course and that maybe one of some of the students or student groups kind of brought to your attention that made you see maybe an opportunity for it to be positive or that confirmed, you know, your original opinion of the project was correct. I do still think that the big question, which is, uh, which let's say remains unanswered as a broader project, the project of the Mayan train is, is what does infrastructure do and who does it cater? And how, does the, how do the design disciplines relate to infrastructure? And, and I think the question of, um, at least that some of the groups were putting forward is that whether we should expand our notion of infrastructure from that idea of a physical, a hard, engineered infrastructures to questions of social, educational, uh, even political infrastructures, ways of leveraging uh, and distributing power in more equ equitable fashion. I mean, the group that uh, at the end of the day was doing uh, toilets, and let me put it, kind of emphasize that idea that the outcome of the, this group of four students was producing uh, sustainable toilets for a region in Yucatan that had, uh, had a deficit in water and switch infrastructure. Uh, this kind of studio proposition would have been sort of a, a strange 30 years ago when I, when I was finishing my MR2. Uh, and, but it just goes on to show of how sensible the design uh, uh, students have become to, to these questions. Uh, it was probably more, we were thinking 30 years ago about questions of hyperdensity and we were thinking about the large scale in a kind of a more em enabling and empowering way for our discipline. And I think when one is uh, thinking about the toilet, when one is thinking about uh, doing a transport oriented development to bring education in a more equitable fashion along a region, it's, a, it's redefining infrastructure. So I think that's a, um, that's a very powerful um, and actually optimistic uh, 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 outcome from the studio, at least from my perspective. Thank you. Well, that leads nicely into another question. And after this question, we'll have time for maybe one more. So if any other participants would like to add an additional question, please do so now. Um, you were talking about the disciplines in your practice and how you really see the interdisciplinary um, method, I guess, if you will, about um, you know, landscape planning and architecture kind of coming together as one. And just wondering if you see that as moving forward where kind of all practices will have to take into account all the design disciplines, maybe even beyond our three pillars at the GSD um, when they're opening or considering growth. Oof. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I, I mean, um, I have, um, I have to say, I, I feel sometimes I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm a kind of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, I have to answer uh, through the questions and challenges that uh, we have a, a, as a professional firm. Uh, sometimes, uh, I, I won't say straying away, but at least uh, having to be more pragmatic about some of the challenges and the questions we we work with, uh, and at the same time, the kind of the the the, uh, the possibilities of the academic studios to bring back certain discussions which I think remain relevant. I mean, as a kind of an anecdote, Jimena David, uh, after her return and graduation from the GSD, she's now working at our office, and uh, she's a. Uh, 
she's uh, well uh, we've had during the summer um, uh, a few GSD uh, interns uh, but uh, she's now a kind of a, I would say she's a, the first uh, mop that we're hiring at the office the first person to come from the world of political science and I think I, I think the, that she has opened not only to our wider team but also to Saidi and myself new ways to to bring back uh, uh, these other disciplines into the into what we do which is kind of very much geared to to design in an old-fashioned way so to look at old-fashioned problems through new uh, new fashion perspectives i think that's what uh i think that's what peggy and uh, and sarah were talking earlier i mean i, I was almost taking notes <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. And thank you for, for of course, for, for your internships for DSC students and, and hiring the graduates. It's a pleasure. We really do hope. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're fortunate to be, I mean, in spite of the circumstances, uh, to have a steady flow of work. So I, I look forward to having a kind of a community. And not only, I mean, uh, not only the recent graduates, but also alumni to, to think about collaborations at, uh, at large uh, because we're always looking for, for those kind of uh, com expanding conversations. Well, we have another question uh, from David Hamilton. It is, have you had students who could bring financial analysis into these studios? We've had, because of uh, the fortune of having a multidisciplinary studios, um, I'm, I, I'm actually surprised by the depth that uh, many of the planning students are bringing to the discussion. So where we, when we were doing the, the studio about uh, the, the Bajio region, uh, industrialization and, and de industrialization, uh, some of the MUP, MUP students were actually thinking about how do we finance and do the cross subsidies to produce affordable housing, which is, let, let me say, the big question of housing. Uh, whether uh, Berlin, uh, London, New York City, uh, or Mexico City, we are very much at the at the heart of uh, discussing how do we find us affordable housing. Um, and I was happy to see that in in those studios uh, about uh, really getting to the nitty gritty of the numbers, uh, almost as if it was a real estate uh, development course. Some of the students were uh, were thinking financially. Um, in this in this studio about um, about the Mayan train, uh, actually Lamias and Brett's uh, uh, studio uh, pr a project was actually quite compelling because they were looking at impact on the train on the territory, and then understanding how the budgets of those municipalities were being allocated and were creating also certain asymmetries of investment, so kind of a replication of inequity in a territory. So by looking at, uh, at budgets, which in the GSD studio would seem almost like far off, I mean, why would anyone look at municipal budgets? Because through municipal bu budgets, we replicate inequity. We reproduce patterns of development which are sometimes toxic and sometimes positive. So they looked at this, the finance, and they look at the impact on the train, and then they looked at how to reorganize uh, the monies, the public monies, and the impact of the train in a more equitable fashion. So, and, and I think there's a lot of work to do in this, and I appreciate the, quest, the question. And I wanna say thank you again, Jose, for your time today and for sharing this mini course and for just all that you do for our students and the help you do in Mexico City to raise awareness about the GSD with our alums and friends down there. We have an excellent community and it's in a large part thanks to you. So really thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs>